welcome everyone to our school board candidates forum on behalf of everyone at PPIE, where I have the great pleasure of serving as executive director. And on behalf of our good friends at the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce and the Pleasanton Weekly, we are happy to co-host this forum for the benefit of our entire community. It is my pleasure to now introduce Gina Chanel, president and publisher of the Pleasanton Weekly, who will guide us from here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Steve. Um, welcome again to the Pleasanton Unified School District Candidates Forum. And I also want to thank um, our partners, the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce and PPIE. Uh, tonight we have five, challenge, uh, five candidates competing for three at-large seats on the Board of Trustees. We have incumbents Steve Mahar and Jamie Yee and challengers Mary Jo Carrion, uh, Kelly Mikashi, and Chong Wong. I'm Gina. I'll be your MC tonight, your moderator. My co-moderator is Jeremy Walsh, editor of the Pleasanton Weekly and Danville San Ramon. Uh, thank you to our community members. There were many of you who submitted questions prior to this event. Uh, we will not be monitoring chat and all of our questions are variations of the questions that you sent. The candidates were not given the questions prior to the event. So going over the, the rules again, we're going to start with two minute opening statements from each candidate. I thought it was three. No, it's two minutes opening, three minutes closing. Um, two minutes opening statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to our questions. A countdown timer will be visible to everyone. Candidates going over the time limit will be alerted and stopped. At the end, each candidate will have three minutes for closing statements. Because we have five can candidates and limited time, we have asked candidates to save any rebuttals for their closing remarks. Candidate Carrion, uh, we will, you will be starting with your opening statements first and we will alternate who speaks first during the questioning portion of the program. Candidate? Okay, hey, good evening. My name is Mary Jo Carrion and I'm a candidate for the Pleasanton School Board. My career has been dedicated to making a difference in the lives of students and families. As a 33 year elementary school teacher, I know how important it is to have a good leadership on our school board. As a parent, I've also had two of my own children graduate from our excellent Pleasanton schools. When I retired earlier this summer, I wanted to continue serving Pleasanton families. Students have always been my focus as an educator. As a school board member, I will ensure that every decision we make puts students first. I am dedicated to and passionate about the field of education and believe that I can make a difference serving you on the school board. My priorities include keeping students, staff, and families safe as we navigate the global pandemic, recruit and retain excellent teachers and staff, improve trust with the community by having open and transparent communication and by being fiscally responsible. This summer, I was appointed to serve on the school reopening committee. Working with teachers, community members and staff, we navigated the many issues on being able to reopen school during a pandemic. We came up with a comprehensive learning plan that is being implemented now. I hope that that we will have a chance to talk about your experience with our schools. I am listening and I pledge to be accessible and work hard on your behalf. I believe that by working together, we can accomplish great things. It would be an honor to serve you on the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Mahar. Hey, good evening. Uh, thank you to the Pleasant Weekly, the Chamber of Commerce and PPIE for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Steve Maher and I'm current president of the Pleasanton School Board. I'm running for re-election to the board. As an experienced board member with 40 plus years of teaching and school administrative experience in Pleasant, I would be honored to again serve on the PUSD board. Never before has the educational system faced such challenges, both academically and monetarily as it does today due to COVID-19. Pleasanton must continue to devote its energy, resources and skills in implementing this progressive and accessible educational program for all students. I bring a wealth of educational experience and proven leadership, both as a classroom teacher and as a school site principal. 
In 2016, 2016, I ran on the platform of providing leadership stability across the district and better addressing the needs of the at-risk student. We now have a superintendent starting his fourth year, experienced cabinet members and skilled site administrators who are providing consistency and stability. Although we have made strides, we must continue to push for accountability and accurate tracking data when we support or underserve and at-risk students. This year's focus must be and has been on providing a robust remote learning program for all students and ongoing planning for the reopening of in-person learning. In reopening, the district must strictly follow all current guidelines outlined by the Alameda County Public Health Department to ensure the health and safety of students, staff, and community. This must be accomplished while operating on reduced funding from the state due to its lack of revenue. It's a heavy lift for the district, but one that we are implementing. A trusted and experienced leader is what is needed. I am that leader. I would be honored to once again serve on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Mkashi. All right, thank you. I would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce, the Pleasanton Weekly, and PPIE for this opportunity. I am running for PUSD School Board because I want to make a difference, not only for my three children enrolled in the district, but for every single child enrolled in our school community. During these challenging times, during the pandemic, I want to advocate for every child, including meaningful e-learning instruction, valid assessments, and also not to forget to promote creative, inquiry-based learning to help keep our children engaged and motivated. I have over 25 years of experience with a double master's of curriculum and administration. And I know what to do with that master's degree. It's putting it into the field and making it practical. I have over 10 years of e-learning experience. So I'm familiar with how to make teaching, uh, working with learning management systems and how to use effective strategies, asynchronous learning instruction that will be meaningful for our students. I have a broad perspective, having worked nationwide in districts like Trenton, New Jersey, Houston, Texas, and Harlem. So I have worked with a wide variety of student populations, and I understand what it means to work with those diverse students and at-risk students and what their needs may be. And that applies for Pleasanton because our demographics are changing rapidly. I want to be the voice for every child, including their cultural backgrounds. Interestingly, I have worked the last two years on adapting curriculum for cultural responsiveness. So that it's not only what we modify in the curriculum, but what do we do differently engaging our students? I have personally led districts through the change process as an education consultant working with Pearson Education. So I know what it was. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to stop you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, so candidate Wong? Okay, am I on? Hello? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Chong Wang. I have lived in Pleasanton for six years and have two kids attending Pleasanton schools. I am running for the board because I believe the schools are the backbone of a community that I can bring forth new voice and perspective as a parent. I am an active um, member in the community, volunteering in various school events and serving neighborhood watch as a block captain. I hold a master's degree in computer science from Stanford University and has worked in high-tech industry for over 20 years, which gives me experience in leading larger teams and collaborating with people from diverse backgrounds. I'm currently working at Entrust as an IT consultant. As a member of the District Superintendent Budget Advisory Council and the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee, I have the financial knowledge and the analytical acuity to make a sound budget decision and bring transparency to the process. My vision is to support PUSD as a top school district via high quality educational and 
extracurricular program in a health and safe learning environment for all students. If elected, I would work diligently to maintain district health and safety, sustain the physical soundness, and enhance communication and support for students, parents, and the teachers. I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And candidate Yi. Hi, um, Gina, I'm really missing not doing this in the studio like we normally do. <laughs> I guess this Thank works. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Yi, and I was first elected to the school board in 2008. So I bring a lot of experience and knowledge to this public health or uh, to the public school world and also um, a longtime resident of our community. My parents actually moved us here 51 years ago this November. So I've been here for a long time and I, I know a lot about the community and I care deeply about the community. You know, when I first started um, getting involved in school district um, advocacy, it was through the PTA. And in the PTA, I learned how to be an advocate, a really serious advocate for public education and for kids. And that's continued throughout my last 12 years on the school board. I have a lot of relationships with our legislators. I definitely know how to navigate Sacramento um, policies. Uh, I understand the ed code and I know who to go talk to um, when we need to have some uh, serious conversations about budget and different things that our legislators can help us with. Um, I'm really um, looking forward to increasing our health and safety in our district, um, which includes social emotional supports for our students, planning for the future and ensuring that we have um, accountability at all levels. And um, in my day job, I work in the public health world and I can really bring a lot of that perspective with what's happening with the pandemic um, by being at the forefront of what's happening um, with COVID and um, what the public health um, team is telling us to, uh, providing us direction about what to do in this current pandemic situation. Um, I would really appreciate to be reelected again. I think that I bring experience and knowledge and stability to the district. And I would like to continue for another four years. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we're gonna move on to the questions. And again, um, you have 90 seconds to answer. Um, Jeremy, you are going to ask the first question, correct? All right, thank you, Gina. <laughs> uh, and as a reminder, we will be going alphabetically. Uh, Gina and I will help guide everyone through that process. Um, so our first question will go to Steve Maher. And let's begin with the COVID-19 and shelter conditions. How do you feel about schools reopening? What specific steps or measures would you recommend to ensure safety for everyone? And until students can safely return to campus, how will you look to support remote learning? Okay, well, that's a, a lot in a minute and a half. But just to begin with, it's yeah. my understanding in, in speaking with the county is that Tuesday we may, we may move to the red tier. If we do, then we'll, if that remains on the red tier for 14 days, then we'll be able to move forward with the possibility of reopening. With reopening, there's guidelines set by the Alameda County uh, Public Health Department, such as safety and use of protective equipment, including masks, cleaning, disinfection, ventilation, cohorting of physical distancing of students, staff, and parents, triggers for switching classes, on or off if you have to move back to remote learning, and evidence that the district has consulted with labor groups, parents, community, and the reopening planning. Plus, we have to have a contract with a um, provider that will take the testing and do the testing. Right now, the county's trying to get one provider because uh, we're hearing that it's $100 a pop to get students tested or teachers tested. So we're hoping to get a certainly reduced price on that. So once we move to, um, to in-person learning, then we will look at our TK to two, and we'll do a hybrid. By that, I mean, it could be A and PM for kindergarten with a time slot in the middle to clean or a different classroom, or it could be alternating days, Monday, Tuesday, possibly Thursday, Friday, with Wednesday be a cleaning day. Uh, again, our, our foremost um, issue that we'll be facing and what we'll be really paying attention to is, is providing safe, clean and environmentally safe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and the other part. Okay. 
All right. Uh, next up, Kelly Mokashi. Great question. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, serve on the steering committee this past summer. Um, and as uh, Trustee Maher has mentioned, there are a lot of pro protocols the district has put in place to ensure, number one, safety and health, not only for our students, but for our teachers as well. So that includes the PPE um, equipment, um, temperature checks. I even had an opportunity to uh, talk with personnel this last week in terms of additional uh, measures that are coming up each week with the district is being provided additional resources to help even impact the cleaning uh, safety of the rooms. As um, already mentioned, I do support a hybrid model and it's already been slated for the K-12 age group to enroll once as the county states and the guidelines that the district is adhering to is safe for our safe return for our children, which is paramount right now. Uh, one part of the question that was asked is what will we do? It's really important that we support our teachers and our students and parents to keep our children engaged with the learning process to help support them remotely in the time being. And that is paramount because number one priority is having our children learn in the best, safest way possible. Thank you. Uh, next, Chong Wong. I think, I think you're muted. There you go. Okay. So, um, as we talk about the current uh, um, uh, remote learning situation, I think as a parent, I think it's a better, uh, the situation is better than we, we used to be in last uh, semester. Um, however, there is a, a room to improve. Um, I talked to uh, some of the uh, parents that, uh, for example, one parent has a, a child in K, I think that um, um, it's really hard for uh, the parents uh, to help teach, uh, the, the K students to, log, to do the several logins. And I think that the situation will be getting improved. Um, and uh, as regarding to the returning to the school, um, the safety, of course, is uh, the top. Uh, um, uh, I, will, I, I will take the highest standard to protect the student as the teachers. And, uh, and also, I understand that uh, I support the uh, uh, hybrid mode as well. So that uh, if, but we do need to give the, the student and the teachers the option to let them make the decision whether they want to be back to school or stay in the remote learning. And uh, also I'm uh, trying to organize the parents, uh, uh, volunteer uh, parents uh, from the community to collect the, the feedback to, uh, and, um, for the school district to improve the uh, remote learning education uh, uh, quality. Um, again, that's, uh, I would like to take uh, any uh, safe uh, approach to protect this community. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jamie Yee. Okay. Um, First of all, I think that everything that Trustee Maher outlined is definitely um, exactly um, you know, what we're looking at, and so I'm not gonna repeat any of that. But um, how do I feel about school reopening? You know, it's really not a great situation that we're in right now. School absolutely needs to reopen, but we need to do it in a thoughtful and measured way that um, ensures the utmost safety. And I know that our district has worked really hard to have a great plan. Um, I've really been paying a lot of attention of what's happening with our schoolhouse services to make sure that we're well resourced, well staffed. Um, I know that there, um, there needs to be a little bit more support around supporting our students that have um, some mental health issues and they need more um, emotional, social emotional support. Um, but uh, supporting the remote learning really needs to, I mean, we're, it's better than it was in the spring, but we definitely have learned a lot. And there definitely is um, some area for improvement. Um, the technology for both students and for teachers, we need to do a little bit more paying attention to. But I do want to say that we never really had a help desk before, and now we've got one. The district quickly um, implemented that, and I think it's been very helpful. 
but we need to do a little bit more. And we want to make sure that all of our teachers have the most up-to-date, uh, you know, good technology to be able to um, provide the instruction that they need to provide. Thank you. And final respondent, Mary Jo Carrion. It is really crucial that we keep students and staff safe. And so once the county has decided and given us the go ahead, the green light, then we can make sure our job as a board is to make sure we have policies in place that support that. For example, as a classroom teacher, I, I had the policy last year to make sure our doors were always locked and always kept closed because of intruders. So does that need to change? Well, they said we need to have proper ventilation due to COVID. So we need to make sure our ventilation systems are up, up to par. And if not, is there a policy in place for keeping doors open? And can we, t can we teach outside in the classroom? Um, once the kids go, I also suggest looking at other schools who have been successful across the country. There have been some schools that have been really um, damaged because they have a lot more COVID cases coming. So we need to see what schools have been successful. The learning plan right now is a hybrid. They have K2 and special day classes coming back first. We need to support them in making sure they are completely safe. And if they're not safe, they should not go back. But if they are safe, what do we need to support them? Do they have the materials? Do they have technology? Do they have um, supports and policies in place to support them? Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to question two, and we're going to start with um, candidate Mukashi. Um, what are your thoughts on the district's budget, given uncertainty of state funding and other variables? As a board member, how would you determine budget priorities? Are there any areas you would not consider cutting? That is a really great question and something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, you know, our district is unique compared to some other districts, um, you know, in other parts of the, of the U.S. where they might have more federal funding, Title I and Title II. Our district does not ha have that um, benefit. I've been thinking about a couple areas that could be improved in terms of really shoring up our budget. One area one particular category that stands out for me, um, how to increase revenue. Currently, the district has only slated $310,000 in that category. I'd like to pose some questions on what else could we do differently to increase that revenue? Perhaps it's something we haven't tried before, partnerships with new businesses, or per perhaps a district fundraiser, something special that has very targeted use for those funds. In terms of um, budget cuts, one area that could be looked into is an audit for the non-personal areas. Um, you know, really looking hard and fast at, you know, what could be um, trend down. I know the district's already done that, but it could be looked at deeper. Another area also is um, really realigning the staff with enrollment. And lastly, uh, perhaps an audit on our curriculum pro programs. This is the best time to renegotiate education services not cut them, renegotiate. So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. And um, candidate Wayne. Okay. As I said that I'm in um, superintendent budget advisory council. Currently, um, our school district have a uh, um, 174 million dollars revenue, and we are spending. 180 uh, million dollars, and uh, uh, 80 percent are spent on personnel, and uh, about 15 percent spend on operation. So, um, so our si situation is uh, uh, 90, 97 percent of the revenue is from a, a state uh, budget allocation, and so that's a state. There are going to be um, a state budget deferral uh, upcoming uh, in the upcoming next year. So which, which, which will be a $20 million. So that's definitely going to uh, create the financial challenge uh, to our school district. And also that's, um, um, we don't know what's, uh, what's going to, be, uh, what's going to uh, be the situation in the next year. The next year uh, could be even worse. So we need to prepare for that. Um, as I said, uh, um, as uh, um, we uh, talked about that part is a non-personal um, 
cut is the preferred, and we are trying to um, save them, uh, trying to increase the revenue uh, through uh, several um, several ways. Uh, for example, increase uh, community giving, explore the partial tax, and uh, district the revenue generation effort, and also savings through efficiency. That's Thank you. Thank you. 90 seconds goes quickly. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, candidate Yi. Oh, I'm on mute. I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, you know, it's, um, it's always a really difficult thing when we have to cut in the budget. And I think we've already started, we already started those conversations um, before the school year ended. And we went through a lot of different conversation about what could be cut, what could we, what we absolutely needed to save um, and not get rid of. And the legislature actually does not allow us to lay off any of our food service workers or any of our custodial staff. So that's off the table right off the bat. Um, you know, I, the question was what I would not want to cut. So hypothetical, I guess, um, because it is a, is a very large, dis larger discussion than just me. Um, I would not like to see any cuts in our schoolhouse services. I really think that we need all of our um, people that are medically trained um, we shouldn't cut any of our counselors or any of our support services that we provide for students. That's the most important thing. Because if our students are well supported, it actually makes the teaching and learning a lot easier um, or more effective for our teachers. So actually supporting the students is actually sort of in effect supporting the teachers and their ability to provide instruction. So um, it's, yeah, it's never an easy thing to make cuts, but it does take a bigger conversation than just what I would like to see. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Carrion? Um, I would always advocate for the cuts being farthest away from the classroom. Um, and I really think that we would uh, be in our best interest to be fiscally responsible. We have to make cuts. So I feel like we need to expand our budget advisory committee and expand it to more people in our community. I feel like we have a great community and people are smart and we can work together to solve this problem. For example, in 20, 20, 2008, when we had the budget crisis, people came together, the teachers union and the administration and the parents in our community, we all worked together and we made cuts. They were painful, but we worked together. And I believe that our community can work together to make these cuts. Again, um, we need to have a balanced and sustainable budget, and we need, but I also agree that we do need to secure additional funding. So we do need to look at parcel taxes in the future or um, um, other ideas. And that's why I think the community support is really important. If we work together and brainstorm ideas for additional revenue, that would be very helpful. But again, the cuts need to be farthest away from the classroom because um, the kids are, all of our decisions need to be what's best for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Mahar. Situation. Unfortunately, um, cuts to people are what uh, save you money. And I'm not looking to do that. I think that I would like to stay as far away from students and from athletics if possible. I think especially now when we come back to school, athletics and camaraderie and togetherness for students is gonna be very critical because the social interaction that they have lost. I would look at our property, we own some property, possibly, possibly leasing or even selling. I know that people say, well, we're saving that for a rainy day. Well, today might be the rainy day. And because as you probably know, we had $11 million shortfall and now it's down to about five and a half million dollar shortfall. So we have to come up with that. I would look at increasing facility fees. I would look at looking at all the departments and school sites and let's reduce your budget budget by 10 to 20 percent. Look how we can cut and consolidate. And then I would also look at forming a committee, a wide range committee of all stakeholders, much as was mentioned, to really look at what can be uh, kind of shaved off the budget so we can save money. I would also also would look at uh, looking at maybe early teacher retirement. If we can get some of our, I know they're experienced, but older teachers, if they will take an early retirement, when you hire a younger teacher, then the cost is a lot less. We might also look at some benefits that we might be getting that we can streamline or, or prorate out over a time period. So there are many different avenues that the district can look at. But again, we have to look at, uh, have a committee of stakeholders, superintendents, parents, and then look at 
what would be best for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, candidate Makashi. I think she started. Oh. Yeah. You're right. I'm That's right, back. right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're Ron, right. Oh. It's your, it's your, go for it, Jeremy. I got it. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with candidate Wong. David Hagland is in his fourth year as superintendent, returning stability to the district administration after a run of considerable turnover. How do you assess Hagland's performance leading PUSD so far, and how will you work with him to achieve your goals for the district? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, when Dr. Hagland uh, came to the district, uh, school district, uh, I had a meeting with him several times. Um, one, one sentence um, I, I talked to um, Dr. Hagland is that uh, um, he, when he talked about his vision, I, I, my comment is that you have a, um, uh, we have a great future, a bright future, but we have an ugly re reality. It's, uh, that's my comment. That's, um, he, he actually, uh, uh, we actually uh, joke about that part. At, uh, but I think that uh, uh, after several years, um, Dr. Hagelin did a great job and uh, uh, stabilized uh, um, um, the, the school district. Um, I think that um, he's uh, very open uh, to communicate. And I of, uh, also um, have a, a conversation with him uh, and also exchange email with him. I think that uh, in the future, I'm going to continue to uh, talk to him frequently to improve the, um, our school district. I'm looking forward to working with him. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jamie Yi. <clears throat> Jeremy, could you just repeat the question? Yes. David Hagland is in, is in his fourth year as superintendent, returning stability to the district administration after a run of considerable turnover. How do you assess Hagland's performance leading PUSD so far? How will you work with him to achieve your goals for the district? Well, being that I'm um, currently a board member, I've had the opportunity to um, evaluate him for the past three years. And um, I would have to say that he has done a really excellent job. And how it works is that um, the board members don't necessarily, I mean, we sort of have our own goals that we kind of are thinking of, but we really work on our goals collaborative, collaboratively. Um, because he really needs to take the goals of the whole entire governance team, which are also his goals and our goals together, and then uh, kind of put them out in the whole district as a whole and that kind of permeates down all the way to the classroom. And he's really done that and he's done a really great job with that of, um, of taking uh, these goals and, you know, it's, it's interesting, his, his evaluation document that he writes, his self-reflection, um, is one of the most comprehensive documents that I've ever seen from a superintendent. It is detailed, it has, um, it explains things, it has reflection, it has links, it has, it's a huge um, and very useful document to help you really understand what he feels the goals are. And we can chime in at any time and say, well, you know, I'm not really loving that goal or whatever, but generally we discuss it all in the beginning before he goes forward with it in the, in the beginning of the school year. It's a really, really excellent collaborative process. And um, he's very open to all of our feedback all the time. And, um, and he's very easy to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo Carrion. So four years ago, when David first started, he came to um, the very first day of school, there was an opening. And the first thing he did was he gave all teachers his cell phone number. And I was very impressed with that because I'd worked under many superintendents and that's the first time I ever got their phone numbers. And I actually did call him because he said, you know, come on to my classroom. So he came to my classroom several times. He watched, he read stories. And I really love the fact that he is so collaborative with teachers, school, staff, parents, and I really admire that. And I think that's an excellent quality in a superintendent. So um, I appreciate that. And I love the fact that he takes input from all stakeholders. So I would enjoy working with him because of his collaborative um, personality and his efforts. And I think that I would work, be able to work really well with him because um, that's 
kind of my personality as well too. So I think he's done a great job. He's a fabulous leader and I look forward to him leading in many more years to come, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Steve Maher. Well, as in, in 2016, um, one of my platform was, was bringing stability, much like you mentioned, Jeremy, because we've gone through ad nauseum of superintendents. And so we did a, a thorough, at my urging, a thorough vetting a process of looking for a superintendent, and we found David. David has been extraordinary. He's very collaborative. He'll meet with anyone. He communicates excellently. We get two re, uh, memos weekly from David that tells us um, how the district is moving, what's going on, what might be issues, how each department is handling the week prior. So every week we can expect the information so we're all, all the board members are, are caught up to date to what's going on in the district. He's also open. The other thing that most people may not understand or know is that the board's, one of their chief responsibilities is to hire a superintendent and unfortunately to let a superintendent go also. But one of the main responsibilities is to hire a superintendent and then they set the vision for the district with input from the governing team. We have a very good governing team and I think David's a lot responsible for that. We work together, we collaborate, we respect, and we listen to one another. David encourages that. He encourages that from his staff. He encourages that from his, his cabinet and from on down, even to the teachers who he values immensely, immensely. He thinks the teachers are the backbone of the district. And so he's always out there. And then probably lastly, he loves children and students. And he goes to many clubs. Okay. That's the 90 seconds. And our final respondent, Kelly Mokashi. Thank you. What you're really asking here is, in order to assess Dr. Haglund's performance, we need to talk about his leadership qualities and his leadership style. So let's talk about that. He believes in shared leadership, meaning that he is going to work with every single stakeholder, whether it's the parents, the teachers, the administration. And he's not going to do top-down work. He's going to take it from the bottom up. What I would like to highlight some qualities uh, that Dr. Haglin has modeled through his work that I've observed both as a candidate and as a parent is number one, transparency. He is proud and even told me so in conversations that he makes an extensive effort to communicate, regular communication, not only internally, but with our parents. That builds confidence with the, the school community. Transparency. He is transparent about his decisions. He's honest. He makes it very clear when he's making decisions or the board has made decisions and if there's discrepancies and he explains the rationale. A couple other characteristics is his availability and willingness to work with everything. Lastly, I would just like to say that in terms of um, his execution and, my, and the goals of the board, once again, as mentioned, is in order to carry through with the vision to ensure school success, the governing body working together collaboratively for a coalition of work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we are moving on to question four. Uh, we will start with candidate Yee. Um, what, what is your position on the proposal for the new fifth I'm sorry, fourth and fifth grade school at Donlin, at the Donlin Elementary site. Is this the best strategy for the district to add a new elementary campus, or would you have preferred an alternative plan for the E10 school? Okay, well, that's a pretty big question to answer in 90 seconds. Um, so, um, you know, unfortunately, the land that we really needed was over in the Valley Trails neighborhood. That would have been the perfect spot for a new K-5, but that ship sailed and that isn't going to happen. But I think using the Donnellan site um, was really a great fiscal, um, was, was fiscally responsible because we own that land already. So, um, but now looking into it and given the financial situation that we're in, um, I'm not really sure that we would have the $600,000, $700,000 a year to be able to run that school operationally. So we really do need to take another look at it to see if it makes sense. Maybe it makes sense to add um, 
classrooms at some of the other schools where we need the uh, classroom space. Um, I know that we're probably going to be having this discussion um, soon, um, but it's definitely um, something that we need to rethink. Um, it may not be the best financial decision for us to um, run a whole other school um, and spend $700,000 a year in um, an operational cost. So we'll just, we'll have to really, um, you know, we'll really have to have some thoughtful conversation about this going forward. Thank you. Um, candidate, carry on. Um, this is a very difficult issue because when the decision was made, we didn't have COVID. And I know at the last um, board meeting, they were talking about how actually our enrollment was down. And so I think it's really important that we look at our demographics again and see um, how much this is affecting and what schools it is affecting because um, we do have some financial things that we need to consider. I think it was a good decision to, uh, at, at the time for Donlin, but I really think that we need to have a committee again, uh, people get together and work on trying to solve this problem because again, I'm concerned about the money and I'm concerned about the demographics of, and if we're gonna have enough kids to actually make this um, a feasible, a sound feasible decision. So again, I think we need to get input and have people work on this decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, candidate Mahar. Well, again, as both um, prior uh, people have spoken with, it's a very difficult decision. Um, I actually pushed for Dolan, the, the back of Dolan. I was principal there for six years, and that's a, a viable place to build a school. Unfortunately, as was mentioned, we lost students this year. In fact, we lost over 400 students this year. Uh, whether they will come back or not, I don't know. But I think before we move forward, and right now we're still moving, but before we commit to timelines where we have to submit to the architectural firms at the, at the state, before we start using I-1 funds, we need to take a, a close look of the demographic, de demographics of the area, uh, the surrounding schools. Do we need that facility or we do, do we need to increase enrollment? And right now, it's, it's not on a holding pattern, but it's on a, discussing, a discussion pattern, and one that we need to look at, get a lot of information, discuss it at the board, discuss it with the community and the staff at Dominic, and then we'll make, make a decision to move forward. But too many things are up in the air right now, and, and indications are we may continue to lose students because of COVID. So we have to really look at 400 could be a small elementary school that we've lost. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Nakashi. Yes, that's a, a really good question, um, very complex issue. I think one thing uh, that's um, really important to remember that um, as a board member, um, one has to understand and also working with the board that uh, sometimes decisions are made during a time that makes sense. So yes, I, I believe, as I already mentioned, um, it, it was a good decision at the time, but now it's time to reassess that I'd like to spend a few minutes on, you know, what are some things that need to be done in order to do that effectively? I think it's very, very important, as already mentioned by some of the other candidates, uh, looking at the data for enrollment, yes, of course. Um, I think it's very, very important to survey in multiple ways, uh, you know, perhaps open up a forum conversation to invite the community, parents, staff in the district to have an open conversation about what makes sense now um, based upon current enrollments. And, and now because of the pandemic, we're in a fiscal um, recheck of how to uh, manage our funding just currently, currently with our own uh, school operations. So it may not make sense to continue the project. But I think we have to gather the data and in order to do that effectively, we're going to have to, you know, reach out to the community to gather that information and then use that data to make the most well-informed decision. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last, candidate Wong. Okay. Um, Donald, uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, fourth and fifth school are using I-1 bonds to build. And uh, um, that's uh, um, if that's the best decision. No, it's not because um, in the I1 bond, when P, uh, when the community votes for I1 bond, they are expecting a new, um, I, I mean, completely new elementary school. 
uh, Darlin uh, for under four is fourth and fifth school is not the the one the uh, the community expected. That's a great defeated the uh, the the community um, uh, face uh, trust um, uh, about the, the the future bonds. That's um, uh, as we see um, the result of a major M. So that's um, um, is there um, in terms of uh, operating that school. Yes, that's uh, going to be a, um, um, another big decision for the community. We need to work with uh, um, uh, basically the whole community, uh, school district and board need to work together to come up with the, the, the solution. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mary Jo Carrion. The physical infrastructure of Pleasanton schools is in need of improvement. Since the most recent bond measure failed in March, how would you look to secure funding for deferred projects that need to be completed while also avoiding the cycle of underfunding for facility improvements? And while we're at it, did you vote on the, did you vote yes on Measure M and why? That is a great question. Um, I, as a teacher, made phone calls, I walked precincts, I did everything in my power for every single bond and every single measure that we've had because it is extremely important that we have uh, multiple new ways of revenue. It is crucial to our district. In fact, I would love to be able to lower class size and we can't do that unless we have more funding. So one of the things that I think we really need to do is we need to find out how our surrounding districts were able to get their bond measures passed. What were they able to do? And so um, we need to work collaborati collaboratively with other districts to find out what was successful. And we need to um, have really good open and honest dis discussions with our community to find out why it didn't pass and what we can do to make it successful because I'm sure that if we have um, more open and transparent communication and more buy-in from the community, we'd be able to get it passed. So absolutely, I support it and we need it. And I, will do, I did everything in my power to try to get it passed. And I, would I will continue to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Steve Maher. Well, currently, I, I think everyone knows that I was a big supporter of uh, Measure M. And although it uh, had the majority of votes, it didn't have the majority needed to pass. Um, with that said, there's some things we learned from the, the measure. One is be more specific. We need bond money to refurbish a gym at Amador or rebuild a gym at Amador. We also need to be better uh, prepared to be clear about what it means to people when the bond is passed. For a senior citizen, what will it mean that you will have to pay? You're on fixed income. This is what it will cost you a year if the bond passes. We didn't do that. And then we also need to get our principals and our PTA presidents more involved so they can help us pass a bond or if a parcel tax comes down, down the road. I'm happy to announce that we have a new um, chief business officer who's really keyed into deferred maintenance and working on, on projects. Currently, Amador is just about finished being repainted. PMS has been repainted. Vintage Hills has been repainted. Next year, three additional schools will be repainted. We also have the refurbishing of grounds that's gonna start taking effect within a month. There, those projects are out the bid. We'll start Amador, Foothill, Harvest Park. So the grounds will start looking better. We also put new roofs on many of the schools through I-1 funds. Uh, we also put new air conditioning on a lot of the schools. So we're moving ahead and we have a person now through the hiring, through the approval of the board and the urging of the board, I might add, that we have someone that's taken deferred maintenance serious and really starting to do some work. Thank you. Kelly Mokashi. This is a very complicated um, answer to a very complex problem. So ultimately, you have to look historically what has been successful. And as we know, there has been challenges passing some bonds and parcel taxes in the past. I think it's very important that we dig really deep and ask the hard questions to our residents on you know, what is the resistance or, or the why. So for me, I have a unique perspective having moved here just recently, a couple of years ago, and I am one of those homeowners that have a very high tax bracket. And so it is something to really struggle with in terms of you know, more money that we're already paying and without a clear understanding, it was already mentioned, 
I feel that perhaps a parcel tax, you know, if the price is right, may be more appealing to the residents, but we have to really ask, ask very clearly and have those forms, those conversations, and really hear from everyone on what they feel would work and be most effective. I think that as already mentioned by uh, Trustee Mocker, transparency and clear communication on how those funds will be allocated very succinctly so the residents are confident on how those funds will be spent, I'm sure that we could get a parcel tax or bond um, passed. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Wong. Yeah, um, I was uh, in the group to support the uh, matter M. I donated, I donated the money to it and did the volunteer work. And at the same time, I also talked to the residents who were against the matter M. The issue, the, the issue they had is too much, too soon, and too big. Um, there were 75% voters who support the I-1, and there are only 52.4% for F major M. So about a 20% difference. So when I talked to those people who are against it, some of them said it is, uh, uh, it, if it is a specific and more progress, more, more progress uh, as I, I want, they would support it. So in the future, we need to carefully uh, lay out the plan for the future, by, uh, future bond in order to get uh, uh, the community some more, more, com uh, more community members to support it. Thank you. Thank you. And our final respondent, Jamie Yee. Yeah, this is, um, it was really unfortunate that it didn't pass. I think we missed it by just under 700 votes. So it was very, very close. Um, I worked on the campaign um, very hard and it was such a sad thing that it didn't pass. Um, I think that one of the things that we really need to work on is better communication and education of how a bond works and how the finances work. Um, I feel like a lot of people didn't, don't really understand how that works. You know, as Chong mentioned, people were saying it was too much too soon. Well, what does that really mean? In, in a public education um, institution like ours, it takes like three years to even get the approvals to make anything happen. So if that bond were to, were, were to have passed in March, we still wouldn't see anything uh, being built for two or three years from now. So now if we wait another two years, it'll be, you know, two more years, two more years beyond that. So it's, um, you know, it just, it's, it's really unfortunate that that's the part that people didn't understand are the timelines that, uh, that we have to work under. Um, but I think that if people would, we, we just need to do a better job at explaining and educating people about how a bond program works. And I think that our program was, you know, could have been a little bit more specific, but I think that the goals that we had in it were, were pretty good and what we really needed. So um, next time around, more education, more communication. Thank you. And moving on to question six, uh, we will start with candidate Mahar. How would you characterize the district's current relationship with the teachers union, the Association of Pleasanton's, Pleasanton Teachers? Given budget constraints and uncertain funding we've talked about, how will you work to recruit and retain high quality teachers? Well, first of all, I, I believe we have a good relationship um, we certainly have not had a strike in many, many years. Um, I think that the Teachers Association and the Classified Association, for that matter, really works hard with the superintendent and through his designee, uh, Mr. Hernandez, to, to problem solve and to come up with uh, uh, contracts that are equitable to all, that is fair, that um, we've always been able to give a little bit of a raise, not much, but we're able to give some raises. And so I think the teachers and the classified appreciate that. They appreciate the, the workmanship that the whole team puts together. It's not um, confrontational at all. It's more of giving and taking and compromising. And as we move forward, I think we need to continue that. And I believe we will. We have great associations, great unions, and, and they want to move forward in a collaborative model. Thank you. Um, candidate Makashi. Uh, yes, um, 
I had the opportunity this past week to uh, speak with Mr. Hernandez in HR and to speak. Um, I was actually asking that very, very question. And it was very clear to me uh, in that conversation that the district is working extremely hard to build a strong relationship with the teachers union. And, you know, as Maher, uh, Trustee Maher mentioned, it's, um, you know, as Mr. Han Hernandez mentioned, it's like, he said, you know, I call up um, the president as needed. They, they go back and forth, um, have the necessary conversations so that when it comes to the negotiations, there's a pretty good idea of that give and take process. And, and that's how those qualities are essential for when you're working at, from a district perspective and working um, with teachers as, as well as other organizations as well. Uh, in terms of the second question, in terms of support for professional development or you know how to help new hires and teachers, I think that the district is doing a pretty uh, amazing job with the professional development services. Certainly um, with COVID and e-learning, uh, more specific strategies to make sure our teachers are prepared and confident to work in this new format will be uh, number one priority and essential as well. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wong. Okay. Um, if you look at the history, that's, um, I think that's uh, um, the school district and the teacher union and the classifi uh, classified work union um, uh, pre have a pretty good relationship. Uh, although I mean, it's, they may have a harder negotiation, um, but uh, overall speaking, it's, um, it, it is a, a good relationship. I talked to the uh, the teacher union president and also classified work uh, president. I think uh, um, they, um, they are pretty reasonable. And um, um, in terms of uh, recruiting uh, the, 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 the best teacher, I think that we still, although we, have, we are facing financial challenge, but uh, I think we still need to ha have the strategy to raising funds and uh, to try to uh, recruit the best te uh, teachers um, in the, um, uh, um, in the area, so that so, so that we can um, uh, teachers are backbone of the uh, of the our education system. We should have the best. Uh, um, we should uh, recruit and uh, retain uh, the best the teacher in our school district. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Yi. Um, okay, so um, the question from. I think what you just said is um, our relationship with the union and how do we retain and recruit um, teachers. I think the biggest challenge that we have in this region is being competitive with our pay and our benefits. Um, Pleasanton's a really great district to work for. We have many, many of our teachers that, that land here and work here their entire careers because it's just a great um, collaborative environment where I think teachers, I would hope to think, feel really supported. Um, but getting new teachers in, especially with how expensive the Bay Area has become to live here, um, I just know that we've, we've lost some um, hires that we wanted to make uh, due to the fact um, of, our, of our salary schedule and our benefits. So I think this is a continuing conversation, something that needs to be started um, of how we can start to look at our uh, salary schedule to be more competitive. Um, I think that's probably the number, the number one, the number one thing. Um, our relationship with the unions has always been really good, and um, I would hope that it would continue that way. Um, I used to have conversations with the executive board members on a regular basis, and we haven't done that because the ones I used to talk to retired. So I'd like to really um, get that going again. I think it's really important to have that open line of communication. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, candidate Carrion. Thank you. Um, teachers are the heart and the soul of our school district. And it is really crucial that there is a great um, collaborative effort between the teachers and the administration. And, and the public may not know this about our school district, but we're very unique in that we have something called interest based bargaining. And so when they are discussing these issues, um, they try to solve problems together. It's more of a problem solving. Here's the problem, here's the issue, what can we do to work together to solve it? And again, an issue was in 
2008, when we had this huge financial crisis, the teachers union and the school district work really well together to solve that problem. So I agree that right now it is a very um, good relationship between the two and it really needs to continue. So I think there needs to be more open communication, especially with uh, budget cuts. And the way that you retain and uh, recruit teachers is by teaching, um, giving them respect, by giving them the support, by giving them the tools that they need to be able to do their job. So I think, um, if, again, if there's more dialogue, communication, respect, interest-based bargaining, then I think that we're gonna continue to um, recruit and retain excellent teachers. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with Kelly Mokashi. With the call for police reform, some have raised concerns in opposition of having law enforcement officers permanently assigned to schools as school resource officers. How do you feel about having resource officers in district schools? That's a really, really great question. Um, I do believe that uh, there is benefit for SOR officers. I think uh, we need to talk about um, how they're being used and how can we improve on that. So um, it's my understanding they um, have trainings um, and then you know the officers are working to de-escalate situations that may, may arise. I would like to ask additional questions with the district on how can we improve collaboration between the school counselors and the teachers um, and with the SOR officers on how to help troubleshoot issues that may come up. How do we help really understand the social and emotional needs that uh, may be the root cause of some of the incidences arising? What other training could um, help support working in collaboration with the city and with the district to make sure that all parties involved are well trained and that there are well well understood protocols for situations when they arise so that situations may not necessarily have to escalate so quickly, but what are the safeguards to help ensure that ultimately, how are we driving to the deeper needs of those students when those situations arise? And that's what we need to really look deeply at. And I think we can do it, working in partnership with the city and the district to help find those solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, clearly we have a DL program and a resource uh, officer um, um, in the school. So that's um, uh, my question is, uh, um, is that caused any problem in the past? I, I, the answer probably is no. Not cause the problem, we should, uh, um, we should uh, keep continue for that. And uh, um, the, um, the other thing is that um, um, I heard the discussion in the uh, city council meeting, but, uh, but the, uh, will the police, my, my another question is that, so will the police disappear in the community in the future? The answer is still no. So I, I think that so we should uh, keep the, continue to keep the deer and um, um, the resource officer uh, in, in, the, in our company. Yeah, their program and the resource officer in our company. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Yee. Well, I do know that um, the district and the city have had a very, very good relationship over the years um, on many topics, um, especially on the SRO topic. Um, what I've been saying for many years, um, and now that it's been you know, brought to the forefront, is you know, we should reimagine you know, what we do with the city and how they support us um, in terms of law enforcement. I think that many of the situations they get called into really are more appropriate for somebody that's a, um, a social worker and not necessarily law enforcement. When it is something that really needs law enforcement, then we can call on them. So I don't um, know the exact answer, but I definitely think that we need to reimagine it and relook at it. Also look at cost. Is there a more effective way to spend the dollars? Um, but I think that we, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I just, I really think it needs to be re-looked at. Um, in terms of the D.A.R.E. program, um, that's something that the city has supported the school district with for a long time. But I always have the question about D.A.R.E. 
you know, what is it that the outcomes are of the DARE program and is it effective? And I haven't really ever gotten an answer about that over the years. And that's something that I would like to push a little harder on. Um, you know, are we, are we getting any bang for the buck out of, out of that program? And maybe those funds can be utilized in another more effective way. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Jo, carry on. Um, we do have some serious issues going on in our country with um, systematic racism. And it's very, very challenging right now. And so this summer when all the protests were going on, I went and I did some investigation in our, our school district and in the Pleasanton Police Department. And I was very happily surprised. And I actually did talk to some police officers. They are doing a lot of training. They've been doing training on de-escalation for six years. And they are doing bias training, which I think is great. And so I would advocate for some more training. But um, my daughter is a counselor in the San Ramon schools. And she... Um, if, if a student has a crisis and they like want to commit suicide, it's something called the 5150. She as a counselor cannot call and get help. She has to call a police officer. So it is crucial to have an SRO in the schools that have a relationship with the students and with the staff so that they can work together to solve the problem. And right now in our community, we have the community support for SROs. Our SROs have training, they have support, they are working really well with our community and with our students and with our staff. So just like um, Jamie said, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think always more training, more support. But right now our community does support having them in the schools, all, all the grades in their program and in the high school and middle schools. Thank you. And Steve Maher. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate because I was able to work with SROs and their officers throughout my career. And I always found them to be upstanding, outstanding people. But I, th I think before you make any type of decision of this magnitude, that you know more than half a million dollars is probably invested by the city into this, we need to really take a closer look. We really need to get information, ask people, and then we need to bring the community. I, I don't have a total picture of what the community feels. They may feel, I'm talking about the adult community, that they want that DARE officer and that, that SRO officer in their high schools. I don't know, they may. So we need to really do an in-depth, uh, discussion and and really look at the program. Now, that being said, do I think that as uh, Ms. Carrion said that counselors can't uh, call, they have to call an officer for a 5150, then maybe we need to make sure that we train uh, our counselors and our officers to deal with the 5150, put more money into training so they can make a, an educated decision of what has to happen with that student. But when things are uh, chaotic, which very seldom they are, or there's a fight, which very seldom there is, then maybe we need an SR officer for that. But again, you shouldn't make any rash decisions or rash, rash judgments before we have all the facts. And we need to sit down with the city, police captain, city um, council members, mayor, and the school district, superintendent, and so forth, and really discuss what they do for us, what training they have, how useful it is, and do we want it to continue. I would not make any move without any of that. Thank you. Hey, and uh, I, we're going to have to make this our last question, so we have ample time for uh, closing statements. And we're going to start with uh, candidate Wong. Um, how will you engage students to help shape policy and program changes to encourage the positive evolution of the district and their own education. Okay, that's a, a, a really tough question. That's um, how that um, I um, I would um, I would like to first of all talk to the students to understand their perspectives, and uh, also uh, get student um, body uh, to involved in the policy making. And uh, I think right now we have the student uh, um, um, uh, uh, representative uh, sitting on the board. Uh, so uh, that also uh, help the student to understand uh, the, um, uh, how the uh, um, um, board make the policy. And also we need to advertise, enhance the communication uh, to the student. If you look at the uh, survey that's um, it says uh, the, the, the communication is the lowest bar in the survey. 
So that's uh, we need uh, to enhance this uh, communication among the, uh, the, the board members and, uh, and uh, the students to un totally understand their perspective and their needs so that, uh, so that we can uh, have a better engagement for the students uh, to the board uh, when, we make, uh, when the board makes the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Yi? Well, this is my favorite part, the student engagement. Um, I spent nine years working at Alameda County um, at a youth center serving um, 12 to 24 year olds and, you know, did my work every day around kids and it was great. I loved it and I really, I'm not there now and I really miss it. Um, just last week, I had a Zoom call with some of our high school students. Um, I reached out to them because I wanted to know, I wanted to hear from them how remote learning was going you know, what was positive, what was challenging. We also had a really engaging conversation around racism. Um, I got to hear lots of their opinions about our social studies curriculum. And I think that, you know, continuing to do that just to reach out to students to hear from them. But from the dais, you'll always hear me asking staff, how many students were part of this committee? How many students helped review this curriculum? How many students did we ask, you know, about this whatever topic? Um, I'm the one that always is asking that question. And early on, um, when I first got on the board, I was the one that advocated for student board members. And we've had them for several years and it's been a great addition. And I'm hoping that it um, ramps up a bit and how we, and how we um, uh, have them join our board. I'd like for the students to be able to choose their own board members instead of the staff deciding but it's a definitely a really important part of a board member's role is to engage with the students um, as part of our greater community. The, they're the customer. Thank you. Um, candidate, carry on. So in my 33 um, years of teaching, one of the things that I've learned is that um, kids, students, they wanna be listened, they wanna be heard. And they are, wonderful advocates for themselves. So I love the idea of, you know, what adding on to what um, Jamie was saying, how to give them more of a voice. I love the fact that we have um, an advisory person on the, on the board from high school. Um, again, I think we need to survey our, our students more. We need to get them, we need to have their voices heard more. We need to do maybe input more, especially in the high school level, but even all the way down to um, uh, primary on the committee this summer, um, when I was on the learning committee, they didn't want to survey second and third graders. And I'm like, oh no, they have an opinion too. We need to hear their voice too. So again, it always, always, always involving the community, always asking for input, always asking for their opinion and engaging them would be great. So thank you. Thank you. Candidate Mahar. Well, I, I think working with students is, is certainly important. What my, my family and, and I did is that when I first um, uh, came onto the board in 2016, I decided that each month I would donate my um, stipend to a club or a classroom on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the district. And so I've given money to STEM classes, the science committee, We the People, uh, SIAC, Go Green, uh, mariachi band, special ed classrooms, but part of doing that is they have to talk to me and they have to tell me what they do. And so when I meet with them, they tell me their thoughts, they tell me what they want to see different in the district, what they'd like to see in the district, so I get a clear picture of what they are feeling and, and how they want to see change. And they're very, very bright, they're very astute as to what they need to, to have for themselves and for other students. And so I've been fortunate. I've really made a, a, a practice of going out to the classroom. Again, I'm retired or semi, so I can uh, uh, go out to the different classrooms throughout the district. And so I do that routinely. And so to try to get a good pulse on what is going on with our students. And so I will continue to do that if I'm elected again. Thank you. Candidate Makashi. This is a great question and one I'm really passionate about. Serving uh, as a member of the Youth Commission and how the Youth Commission um, brought forward and worked with the City Council to help put together vaping ordinances uh, into the city, I would love to emulate and model that uh, whole process with the school district. So for example, it would be really neat to put together a steering committee for the school board 
and where you might include all, you know, not just the high school students, but the middle school students and as well as some elementary students to work on a potential policy or resolution or something of the sort that the school board may be working on. One that's very, very, very passionate for students right now. I know a couple of weeks ago, um, so high school students spoke at the school board on how to uh, revisit the curriculum related to equity. Um, I would argue not just for social, um, social context and history, but really involve the students to really dig deep on how can we improve the curriculum and the instructional practices um, relevant to be more culturally responsive to respect all diversities, whether it be in language arts or whether it's in the math classroom. We need to include our students' voice, and this might be in a brilliant way to get this done. Just a few ideas that I have. Thank you. Thank you. And as Jean mentioned, that is the end of our questioning period. Uh, each candidate will now have up to three minutes to provide a closing statement. Uh, we will go in reverse alphabetical order this time, and we'll start with Jamie Yee. Okay, whoever thought it would take so long to unmute. Okay, um, I'm uniquely qualified um, and bring a different perspective than any of the other current board members or candidates. In my day job, I do work in the public health world and um, my work for healthcare services agency in the public health department is one of our departments. And I'm acutely aware of the data and the trends of this pandemic. Um, I'm also acutely, um, I also for over 20 years have been an, an adolescent and school health advocate and very well versed in health and wellness issues. And during this time of our new normal, there needs to be a greater focus on our community health, and that includes the social and emotional health of our students. People who know me and know about my work on the board are keenly aware of how I advocate for the marginalized and the at promise students, whether it's academics or discipline issues. I'm the voice um, for the students who typically don't have a voice. Uh, Mark Miller, one of my colleagues on the school board, is quick to remind people that a governing board's most important job is to set direction for the district. And what he says about me is that I'm the strictest advocate of accountability, often asking the tough questions to ensure that our staff are performing at their best. During this next term, I would like to prioritize increasing health and wellness, ensuring accountability at all levels, and planning for the future. I do have a deep understanding of the nuances of accountability. School board members can only make good decisions based on the information that the staff provides. There has to be an environment in which the board members can ask questions freely and request reports, data, background information to understand the agenda items that need to be approved. A culture of collaboration and the ability to have democratic discussions about the issues are critical. The board must adopt budgets, policies, set direction, provide oversight, and maintain a 30,000 foot view of the district. I'll continue to work tirelessly to main, maintain this culture. And governance is not something that you can really read in a book. Um, it's something you kind of have to learn on the job. So um, it does, you really want to have some experienced people on the board um, because it does take a while to get to, up to speed. Um, we also need to have um, in, a plan for the future and growing our own succession planning is something that is really critical to our district to move forward. Um, we really need to give our teachers and anybody who wants to become an administrator or vice principal or even a superintendent for that matter, know that they have a track and how to get to that track. So we really need to have a robust succession plan in fact, um, I, we've put that into the superintendent's goals for this, this year. It's really, really, really critical because eventually he is going to retire and we need to have people who can fill our executive positions. So um, while I'm, um, and I have had a lot of, I guess, out of time, this is so difficult. <laughs> Read about me on my website. Thank you. Uh, next, Sean Wong. Okay, um, um, 
again, thanks for this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, something um, I want to uh, mention about, uh, I'm uh, from uh, China, I'm a first uh, uh, generation immigrant. Uh, I went to Singapore um, as, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, to study and also I was studied at uh, um, LSU at Baton Rouge and also I went to um, Stanford uh, to get my master degrees. And uh, also, um, I want to emphasize that my high tech background, I can bring the, um, um, the um, I have the 20 years high tech background. Uh, the most important thing is that I am a parent and uh, I can bring the uh, parent perspective to the board. And uh, my two sons, uh, one is a senior at Hamdor, the other is eighth grader at Harvest Park. And uh, um, so my top priorities are um, maintain uh, district uh, health and safety. The, the pandemic, unfortunately, um, has disrupted everybody's life and the norms for the past uh, several, um, several years, uh, several months. Health and the safety of our students, teachers, staff, and the community member will be uh, my top priority. And uh, the second one is the sustained physical soundness for the district, uh, for the school district uh, financial challenge. The, the focus is uh, to, uh, the, the short term to, is to address the upcoming uh, budget deferral. Um, and the long term, we still need to uh, look, uh, uh, found the school facility maintenance and, uh, and improvement. The third one is that uh, to provide the support to our teachers and staff. Our teachers are the, in the um, education first uh, front line and they have the uh, good ideas and the opinions we should support them. Uh, my first one is uh, to enhance effective uh, communication um, for all parties. School district board uh, can only make a good policy uh, if it understands the need of the family. A good policy can only be effective if it, if it is understood by the family. A smooth communication channel between the school district uh, board member and family is crucial. So again, um, um, I'm a, I will be honored by, uh, for your vote. Uh, if you want to know me more, please visit my website, uh, chong4pusd.com. C-H-O-N-G, number four, um, P-U-S-D dot com. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Mokashi. Okay, I'm ready. I got the timer in front of me. So uh, first and foremost, I want to share a few things that make me stand out as a candidate for PUSD school board. I am the only candidate that has over 10 years of e-learning distance experience. I understand what it takes to keep our children engaged through this new uh, learning environment. I'm the only candidate that is a former education consultant working nationwide, once again, in districts all over, including Trenton, New Jersey, and inner city. I understand that during this time, we are in a time period of change, and I have been in the forefront working with all stakeholders, whether it be teachers, parents, administration, and how to provide the vision and confidence to help us all know that we will get through this together. I also had unique experience working executive level leadership in the nonprofit world. I served as an executive director for a nonprofit really close to my heart advocating for orphans with Down syndrome. And I also helped start up a board of directors for another nonprofit. So I understand that this role is about policy and governance to ensure that we are providing what is in the best interest for our students. Some of my priorities, I feel, of course, first and foremost, we need to keep our focus on quality education for our students. And right now, the emphasis is on e-learning. We need to remember it's not just the how, but it's also how do we keep our students motivated and how do we dig deeper into the social emotional gaps that they're facing, whether it be engaging with their peers or communication with, with their teachers. The normal assessment protocols, we need to make sure it's not only the delivery of instruction, but how are we making sure our students understand and how do we help meet those gaps? I have three children in the district. 
And I know the struggles that they are facing on a daily basis and how we need to bridge the gap, work with our teachers, support additional collaboration with our parents and teachers so that we can all help provide our students what they need. I would be honored to serve in this district as a trustee for the school board and feel I had a very unique experience to bring to the table but once again, understanding that this is about making sure that we are doing what we need for our students. Thank you very much for your time and would be honored uh, to serve on the board. Please check out my website as well. And thank you again for this opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Steve Maher. First of all, thank you, uh, Pleasant Weekly, the Chamber of Commerce and PPIE for uh, providing this forum. Uh, I, I bring a unique experience and lens to the school with over 40 years of experience in schools, with managing schools, principals of school, uh, seven years as a special ed teacher. There wasn't much comment tonight about our special needs students, and that is a focus of mine. I must get at least four or five phone calls a month about special ed students and pleasant and what can we do, how can we help their child. And especially in this time of, of COVID and remote learning, they are the students that are getting hit the most uh, with processing problems, with attention problems, and we need to do more to assist them. Currently, we're hiring people to be on site to bring those students back if they can when we open up first to get some individual help and, and certainly small group help with distance learning uh, to help them. And we're looking to do that. I also want to uh, speak about a, a couple issues I didn't get to finish on. For one, when we talk about reopening, we've also looked at our ventilation system and we've changed all the filters out to the maximum so that fresh air can come through. That's one of the requirements. We have done that, we're doing that. Also, when we talk about remote learning, when we come back to school, there will also be students who are remote. They do not feel comfortable with coming back to school. So we're gonna to continue to provide remote learning. And those teachers that are doing that remote learning are going to get assistance from two people we hired recently. We hired a, a person that is skilled with curriculum and can help our teachers improve their curriculum. And then we hired a person that is skilled in technology with when things go wrong, such as two weeks ago when Zoom went down nationwide. But we have a person that could get us back online quickly. So the district under our leadership of the board, quite frankly, is moving in a direction to really help our students. We realize that this year, not going to be normal. The other thing that we're clearly uh, aware of is that remote learning is difficult for parents, students, and staff. Staff because of the amount of time that it takes, parents because they're trying to manage their household, work, and help their student. They're under the gun and they're having a, experiencing a lot of pain because they're doing it. And then students because they miss their friends, they miss the social action. We also now have initiated through the board a, a um, a program that if they need counseling, they can get counseling. They just have to call downtown and talk to Ed Dialazzo. And, and we can look at seeing how we can assist them with some issues that they may be having. We're, we're becoming more and more aware of all the things that surround COVID and surround remote learning. And, and lastly, if you wanna know more about me, go to vote maher for the letter number four, schoolboard.com, and you'll see a lot of testimonials, a lot of endorsements from students that I have worked with over the years, and I'm very proud of that. Um, again, I've had seven grandchildren enrolled in the schools of Pleasant. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, candidate. And, and to wrap up, Mary Jo, carry on. Thank you, um, Jeremy and Gina. You guys did a great job moderating, figuring out whose turn it was to speak. I know that must be challenging, so thank you. And thank you to the Chamber of Commerce, PPIE, and Pleasanton Weekly for hosting this forum. I appreciate the opportunity to share my views and to answer questions. Pleasanton has excellent schools. We need to give all students the opportunity to be successful. I have been talking to voters and know we have work to do with some of our community members to rebuild trust. I'm willing to work, do the work to get this done. Students have always been my focus as an educator, and I hope that you will trust me to be that consensus builder, insisting on open, transparent, and collaborative communication. We have difficult decisions to make. 
We need to create opportunities to hear from our community and then lead a thoughtful and respectful decision-making process. Let's work together to ensure that every decision puts students first. I would be honored to have your support. Time did not allow us to answer all the questions, so you may go to my website at maryjoeforkids.org or I'm on a listening campaign. You can call me at 925-750-8225. I'll say that again, 925-750-8225 if you have additional questions. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I almost did it. <laughs> I almost didn't unmute. Um, uh, on behalf of the weekly, I would like to thank the candidates for Pleasanton Unified School District Board of Education for participating in this forum. Um, a special thank you goes to the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce and PPIE for helping us um, produce this. And I wanted to tell you that there will be a recording available within a few days on the Chamber's website and the Weekly's website. We're also obviously gonna follow up with a story on this. So with that, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.